1624, Galileo was again received with great enthusiasm in Rome. The Pope told him that the Church had never declared Copernicanism to be a heresy and would never do so. And the Pope decided to hang on to this idea that Galileo could continue to teach what he wanted to teach as long as it was in, in the realm of theory until such time, if ever, it should become established firmly as fact. Well, Galileo broke the rules. In 1632, he wrote his Dialogue on the Great World Systems. And in this work, he does not, in fact, stick to the idea that the sun being at the center is a mere theory. He suggests that it's a fact. But worse than that was that Galileo wrote this dialogue as a dialogue. And one of the characters in this dialogue was a dunce, a dummy. And into the dummy's mouth, he put the Pope's opinions. Well, you're not exactly going to ingratiate yourself into the Pope's favor by taking his view and putting it in the mouth of the idiot. But this was sort of typical of Galileo, who had a very, very, well, some might say uh, aggressive kind of way about him. He had a very uh, irascible nature. Uh, he had a personality that left a bit to be desired sometimes. So, for instance, if you disagreed with Galileo on something like the nature of sunspots, he would come out and publicly call you a blockhead. But this was not a subtle person. And there's no subtlety at work when you take the Pope's opinion and you put it in the words of the fool in your dialogue. Well, Father Greenberger, who was a Jesuit, who was a big fan of, of Galileo, had said that if he had just kept to the idea that this is a theory and had not tried to make it stick as absolute fact before it could be proven, there would never have been an issue. But what seems to have happened here, the way I read it, is that you've got several factors coming together simultaneously to bring about this unfortunate outcome in the Galileo case. You have the fact that Galileo can't actually prove this and that there is a very good argument against it, the parallax shift argument. He can't answer that. You have the fact that Protestants are putting pressure on Catholics, saying you've got to stick to the Bible. You can't just indiscriminately go and adopt novel interpretations unless you've got really good reason. And then you have this clash of personalities between Galileo and the Pope. And that's a big problem as well. It's the way human nature is. Um, because we all, as we've seen, this Pope, Urban VIII, had previously praised Galileo, had had no problem with Galileo publishing the Copernican theory, and even assured him that the church would never condemn this theory. So it can't just be that the church refuses to allow evidence or refuses to allow science. This was all allowed. The Galileo tragedy occurred because of the convergence of all these factors. Now, that doesn't excuse what happened. Galileo was, uh, in 1633, told that uh, he could not publish in this uh, area at all. does not excuse that. But on the other hand, it helps us to understand it a little bit better, and that's important too. Now, a good many scholars have begun to argue that people at the time, at least some of them, understood that the sentence against Galileo was intended in large part personally against him. Because, for example, Father Boscovich, whom we talked about last time, the father of atomic theory, openly used the idea of a moving earth in his work. And nobody got, he never got in trouble, was never hauled before any church tribunal. So, as I say, a great many people have said that it was aimed personally at Galileo. Now, having said all this, um, as I say, my, my purpose here is not to say that there was no wrong done or that this episode is something to celebrate. But at the same time, I think we can understand that what actually happened here was the fruit not of any mythical Catholic hostility to science, but merely the unfortunate convergence of a variety of factors occurring at the same time. Because what we've seen in these past few episodes is that the church's achievements when it come to, comes to science are legion and are substantial and that we've seen that more and more professionals who actually do this for a living, who study the history of science for a living, are saying that Galileo case or no Galileo case, the church helped to make the scientific revolution possible. And it helped make it possible not simply because a great many Catholic priests engaged in important scientific discoveries or wrote important scientific works or composed great scientific encyclopedias, all of which the Jesuits did. It's not simply that. It's that the church provided the framework in which science was possible. It made us believe that the universe could be understood by our minds and encouraged us to engage in this type of undertaking. 
And finally, be even beyond that, the church encouraged, yes, believe it or not, the free interchange of ideas. It encouraged a culture of debate and discussion. That was the culture that was fostered in the university system of the Middle Ages. And that's what we're going to look at next time. In the universities, we see the Western tradition of rigorous, rational debate, back and forth to discover the truth, taking root. And who was the great patron of that university system? The Catholic Church. So, I look forward once again to being with you and talking once again about another unfortunately unheralded aspect of our Western civilization, the church's fostering of the university system, which gives us our great civilization. Thank you.